Welcome to MEC 410, Design of Machine Elements. This is a lecture on Chapter 15 in our textbook. Some of the information in this chapter is relevant to our Design Project 1, so I wanted to briefly go over the information that's in our textbook. Design Project 1 will be assigned in Blackboard. It has a similar calculation flow to sections 15.5, 15.6, and 15.7 in the textbook, which is why I'd like you to understand the calculation flow in these sections before you start our design project one. So chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 were preparation for this first design project, and they discussed how to specify pulley sprockets, gears, attach them to shafts, design the shafts, specify the bearings, and determine the tolerances. Chapter 15 discusses how to design a torque transmission system using all of these elements, and Design Project 1 will give you some practical experience designing a torque transmission system. In general, you start with a generic system with all the design inputs, which we will give you. In this example from chapter 15, it's a motor with a coupling that drives a pinion in a gearbox. There's a large gear which is connected to the output shaft of the gearbox. There's some bearings that support the shafts. And there is a saw drive shaft that is basically the output of this transmission. Presumably it's doing things like sawing logs or sawing wood or maybe even sawing metal depending on how much torque is really available from this design. First thing you got to do is a compute the kinematics of the moving parts. You are given typically some speeds and some torques or perhaps you're given the horsepower and some speeds of the various shafts and you have some information on the gears, but maybe not all of it. And so you have to calculate what are output speeds of the shaft as shown here and pitch diameters of pinions and gears and center distances and angular velocities. Then you get to calculate loads, moments, and torques at locations of all moving parts on the shaft. You need all of this information in order to calculate the minimum shaft diameters. Then, as shown in chapter 12, sometimes you need to make some upward adjustments for shaft shoulders, bearings, rings, and keys. And so first you will calculate the minimum shaft diameters. You will figure out what design information affects the shaft diameters and you'll raise them up if necessary. Here in this slide on the right side, it's showing some reasons to change shaft diameters that there's key seats and ring grooves. Sometimes there's a sharp fillet that may or may not affect the design. Other times you'll have to change a shaft diameter because you need to go to the next size up that corresponds to a particular bearing that you need to use. Then you will specify the bearings based on the loads and design life calculated. Key issue is that the minimum bore diameter for the bearing overrides the minimum shaft diameter if the bore diameter is larger. And this is a very nice picture from the SKF website that shows you how a shaft seats within a bearing. So here we have the part of the shaft where my mouse is that goes through the bearing, where the bearing diameter determines exactly to a ten thousandth of an inch what you're going to use as the shaft diameter. And here it shows the larger section of the shaft that seats up against the bearing. And it's called the shaft shoulder diameter. And the shaft shoulder diameter must rest on the rotating inner race of the bearing, or it can extend out a little bit. But the one thing you can't let a shaft do is ever touch the outer part of a bearing, because the outer part of a bearing is not rotating. It's only the inner race of the bearing that is rotating. The Bearing outer race, as we see on the bottom, is press fit within a shoulder 
of the housing. Here's the housing, there up top the housing. So if any part of the shaft shoulder touches the section I'm pointing to now, which is the outer race, you're gonna have a massive amount of friction and possibly have the shaft grind to a complete halt. Once you understand all the speeds and torques, then you can do an analysis per chapters nine and 10 in our textbook where you specify the gear material based on the bending and pitting stress analysis. And the goal of that exercise is to figure out a required material hardness, where the required material hardness for the pinion dominates the equations. Once you figure the hardness required for the pinion, you just use the same hardness for the mating gear. Then you get to specify keys for the gears, the shivs, and the sprockets based on loads and diameters. And here at the bottom, we show the key equation that you use for a rectangular key seat where coincidentally the dimensions of the width and the height of the key are the same, which means essentially you have a square key as opposed to just a rectangular key. In our design project, we're also going to have you specify rings to keep rotating parts from moving laterally on the shaft, and we'll give you some information from a catalog, and we'll ask you some questions about which ring to specify. If you have a shaft that's a very odd number, example 1.212 inches, and you find that you can't buy a groove that snaps onto a shaft that has a diameter of 1.212 inches, but you can buy one that says 1.250 inches, you're going to make the shaft 1.250 inches, and then you're going to machine the groove in the shaft, not what you calculated for the minimum shaft diameter at the groove, but you're going to follow the vendor directions for what to machine for the groove diameter. That's what we mean by groove diameter from vendor data overrides the nominal groove diameter specified in chapter 12. You will also have to formulate a general shape of the shaft. If you were doing this design for an automotive company transmission department, you would be creating a preliminary 3D model. We'll dispense with that here, but you have to have the basic sketch of what the shaft looks like because you have to understand which diameters in the shaft are the big ones, typically the ones in the middle, and which shaft diameters are the little ones. So you can understand how you want to position the gears and bearings relative to shaft shoulders. We're going to use one chart table 15-5 from chapter 15 to determine the shaft diameter tolerances for press fit into a bearing seat. This is the case where you calculate a minimum a shaft diameter, then you pick a bearing which likely has a bore diameter a little bit larger than the minimum a shaft diameter. Then you got to go back and adjust the shaft diameter. This table tells you exactly the minimum and maximum dimensions on a shaft diameter based on the standard bearing bores. We'll also determine shaft diameter tolerances within the keys, gears, and sprockets from table 13-3 in chapter 13. Another piece of information from chapter 15 that you'll use is the use of table 15-7 to specify tolerance and fits for the keys and the key seats which does override any of the information from chapter 13. Here, based on known manufacturer's tolerances of the keys, our book publisher in chapter 15 tells you what to make the key seats. And if you were working for the transmission department of the automotive company, you would produce a CAD drawing that looks kind of like this one and has all of this tolerancing, both numerical and geometric tolerancing that we learned about in chapter 13. It would be suitable to give to a numerically controlled machine shop and let them do all their programming in order to make the part. 
And if you work for said transmission design department, you would also create an assembly drawing such as this one shown here, which shows in balloon format all of the components and also gives you a bill of materials table on the right side that defines the components, gives the item number, and in a manufacturing company there's typically part numbers that you assign for all these components.